Uh, welcome to uh, Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Uh, I am Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I am here uh, to host this great new series that Pepperdine is having um, called No Way to Treat a Child. Uh, it's a seminar series on foster care and youth services. Um, and today we are having our second session, which is called How to Family Curve Courts Determine Child Maltreatment and Decide on Foster Care. Um, for those of you who missed our first session uh, about kind of the basics of child abuse and neglect, understanding child maltreatment, uh, we had a guest named Sarah Font. Um, you can find that uh, video on the webinar page for the series. Um, and you can find this, the video that we're gonna be making today also on that page. Um, and finally, um, if you wanna join us for our next session, uh, we will be having one on November 15th uh, at the same time. Um, at uh, noon Pacific time. So um, with that, I wanna welcome our terrific guest today. Uh, his name is uh, Ron Richter. Um, he is the CEO and executive director of JCCA, uh, which is a congregate care facility. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about more about that in a few minutes. Um, but he was the former director of the New York City Administration for Children's Services, a former attorney with the Legal Aid Society, um, and he was also a family court judge uh, in New York City too. Um, and so uh, welcome, welcome uh, Judge Richter, welcome Ron, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Um, so we wanted to start today with kind of some basics. I think a lot of people don't really understand what the role is of family courts in the child welfare system. Um, you obviously have firsthand experience with that, both working for legal aid and working as a family court judge. Um, so I was wondering if you could sort of walk us through the role of the family court uh, when we find out that uh, there's there's been an accusation that a child has been abused or neglected. Uh, this is something we talked about a little bit in our in the first part of our series. Uh, with Sarah, uh, with Sarah Font uh, from Penn State about what child abuse and neglect looks like. Um, but where does the legal system come in? What happens next uh, after that uh, allegation is made? So <clears throat> because of federal law, uh, the Social Security Act in particular, states are required in order to receive federal dollars to support their foster care system, states are required to get orders from a uh, juvenile or family court in order to endorse that a removal of a child was necessary. So once uh, a child protective agency determines that a child is in danger, usually imminent danger, to their life or health and requires removal because of an investigation, the agency is required to go to a juvenile court to get a judge, independent of the government, a judge to endorse that removal. And so the, in the first instance, family court is there to be a check on the awesome power of a child protective agency to actually temporarily remove a child. And that has to happen pretty quickly. I know we should say that the laws regarding child welfare vary from state to state, um, but but the involvement of a court is is needed pretty pretty quickly after or even before a removal is made. It should be before a removal is made, uh, and in many states, courts are available twenty four hours a day so that a removal order can be secured uh, over the phone if necessary. Uh, but uh, in New York, a uh, child, uh, if removed without such a court order, uh, a parent has the right to a hearing uh, within 72 hours. So it is immediate. Um, in, in about half the cases in New York, children are removed um, by court order. So uh, before the agency acts and in about obviously the other half, uh, it is a hearing after the, the child's been removed. Those are emergency removals. So can you describe a little bit of what a typical case that is coming before a family court judge, either in New York City or elsewhere, might look like, what, what that imminent risk looks like, and how frequently this happens? So I would say, first of all, that um, there are removals that occur by the police um, 
you know, the, the, the scenario that some people see on law and order is this, you know, executed warrant, door is busted down, there are two little toddlers and it's a, you know, a rabid drug scene and parents are arrested because it appears that whatever uh, information secured the uh, search warrant was verified, the parents are taken out in cuffs and the two children are brought into foster care. Um, that is, you know, imminent danger. And so there isn't time to secure a removal order. And, and you get those kinds of cases. Um, the, you know, more challenging cases are those where you have a parent who is struggling and um, the agency may be in the process of investigating allegations that generally combine um, some family violence, um, some uh, resulting use of substances, could be alcohol, could be drugs, that um, are also um, being used to address some sort of emotional um, challenges that may rise to the level of a mental illness or maybe not. And so you have this combination of substance misuse, family violence, and potential mental disease or mental illness, emotional instability. And you have a few little kids under five, very typical case. Um, there may be a history in the child welfare system, a parent um, who is young herself, who may have had a life that was connected with the child welfare system. That case comes before you as a judge. And um, clearly the relationship that the mother has with the parents, with the fathers of the three children matter to you. Sometimes those fathers are involved and are in and out of the home and matter to their children, uh, matter to her and they may not get along with each other. Um, one of them may be a constant in the mother's life. Um, and so those cases are really difficult, but not uncommon because you don't wanna separate the siblings. You don't wanna separate them from their mother. And at the same time, there is this imminent danger question about whether the mother can, for example, enforce the order of protection, whether the children can be safe in that setting. In a third of the cases when I sat in Queens County in New York, those families were living in shelter. Also, very challenging situation. Mothers don't often have their own kitchens in shelters. So she's also one, you know, she's also struggling with food. Early care and education settings, very difficult to access in shelter. Inconsistent where she'll be living month to month because families move around in shelter. All of this raises questions for the judge about the children's stability. So if I find out that the mother has a sister or the mother has a mother where the kids would be stable, how do I balance that? Should I even consider it? Does that matter? Um, and so all of these sort of questions come into the assessment, um, even though legally my standard is imminent danger to the three children, and whether I can enter orders that are going to make it possible for the children to remain with their mother. In New York, also thinking about whether the removal will cause trauma to the mother and or the children. You mentioned that the typical case is, uh, you know, involves younger children. Um, can you describe kind of the, the way you assess risks for younger children versus older children and why the safety concerns for younger children seem to be more prevalent? Yeah, so I, I want to say that it's still true that more than half of the children that come into care are under six years old. So, um, you, you know, that's, that's, you know, and, and that, that, that's just a matter of fact, and that's true nationally. Um, and you can understand that, you know, a two-year-old is uh, much less able to protect themselves um, than an 11-year-old is. And so as a judge, you know that an 11-year-old knows uh, how to use a telephone or a, a smartphone. An 11-year-old has feet that they can walk out using. 
Um, you know, an 11-year-old in a custody matter, for example, has a lot to say about what it's like to live with mom or live with dad. Um, a two-year-old is in a very different um, situation. Um, a three-month-old is, an, is in an even different situation. And so a lot of child development informs uh, these questions. Uh, you also have you know, to think about adverse childhood experiences and the comparison of what adverse childhood experiences this three-month-old will experience living with that mother with two siblings in a shelter unit versus being removed from a mother and living in foster care separate from a, a parent because that's an adverse childhood experience right there. And so often as a judge, you're thinking, there, neither choice is ideal. Which one is going to cause more harm long term? Yeah. Um, I wanted to sort of set the scene a little bit, like to, to discuss who is appearing in family court, who the parties are to these cases, um, what they're bringing with them. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, a lot of, in, you know, information, understanding about child development goes into your decisions. Do you think that the kind of modern understanding of child development is informing these decisions enough kind of on a national level uh, in family courts? So I guess two questions there, kind of who, who are the parties who are helping you make this decision? And do you think you know, uh, professionals in the family court setting have enough information to be able to make these decisions well? So let me just back up one second, Naomi, and tell you that I didn't answer one of your questions, which just using 2019, I appreciate you copying to that. <laughs> um, using 2019 uh, data from New York City, I can tell you that there were approximately 54,000 uh, or 55,000 investigations, uh, meaning that out of New York City, there were 54, 55,000 calls made to the state central registry that resulted in investigations. So they were accepted by the state of New York for New York City. About 37% of those investigations were indicated, meaning that there was, at that point, the standard was some credible evidence of abuse or maltreatment. So that is about 20,280 cases. Of those, there were 2,400 removals approved by family court, which means that about 4% of the 55,000 investigations resulted in a removal. So I always like to just be clear that we're not removing anywhere near a lot of kids from the investigations. It is an extreme result mm -hmm. from, uh, fr from a call to the state central registry. We don't just go about removing children. Of course, an investigation is traumatic. So I, I wanna put it out there. And the overwhelming majority of children that are investigated and families in New York City are from our 10 poorest community districts, which in New York are black, and brown communities. That's just how it is. They are. They tend to be overregulated because they receive a lot of public benefits, and therefore there's a lot of reports made. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about that. To answer your question, um, uh, in family court in New York, um, there is a presentment agency or a prosecuting agency, which is the government. Uh, in New York, that is a Department of Social Services. We call it the Administration for Children's Services in New York City. Um, there are, is an attorney for each parent, so every parent gets their own counsel, and in New York, they are entitled to counsel upon the filing of a petition in family court. And in New York, every child gets an attorney. Siblings may be represented by the same lawyer unless there's an apparent conflict and that's up to the judge. Mm -hmm. uh, not every state offers a lawyer representing the um, opinion of the child. It is straight advocacy in New York. Um, there can be a guardian ad litem in some situations for a parent that is not able to make their own decisions. They'll still have a lawyer. Same thing with the kid. The kid could have a GAL as well, less common. Mm -hmm. 
but does, those are the uh, lawyers before you. Mm -hmm. And does New York have, we spoke a little bit about um, CASAs in the last session we did, court appointed special advocates. Does New York have those as well? We do have CASAs. Um, they are um, used not um, in um, most cases. We use them in particular for interstate compact cases, which are very complicated. So a child is in foster care and we want the child to go to North Carolina with a relative and the law requires that we, uh, that we um, engage North Carolina using an interstate between the state of New York where the child is in custody and the state of North Carolina, which is going to essentially take custody or, or oversee the case for New York. That takes a long time and CASA does that on cases. So I might assign a CASA when I have that situation. Um, I just some, in some states, CASAs are the child's representative. We don't I, do I that. Act as the guardian ad litem. Yeah. Correct. Um, I just wanted to pause here and let everyone know that um, uh, starting in about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to be opening it up for some questions. So um, you can start uh, putting those in the chat either when you think of it or if you want to wait a little while until about three uh, until about 1230. Uh, Pacific time um, in order to start putting those in. I just want to make you aware of those if there are questions that start occurring to you now. Um, Naomi, you asked me whether I thought that child development was informing family court decisions nationally. Yes. And, you know, there, there are organizations that work with courts across the country. And, um, you know, there is the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. There's there are state court, uh, national state court organizations. Um, and, you know, there is certainly an effort to um, identify the fact that we know a lot more now about the brain science of uh, zero to three year olds, um, zero to five year olds and adolescents than we ever knew before, right? The last 20 years, there's been an explosion of information. Um, I referred to the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey and the data that came out of the huge Kaiser Permanente survey that if you're an informed family court judge or lawyer, um, you would need to, to, to understand that information because what's going, you have such an opportunity from zero to three. Um, and, and it's really important in my view that, you know, as a judge, you're asking questions about whether a child has been screened for trauma, for developmental challenges, whether you're at the earliest getting um, interventions that might be able to help a kid and asking questions of parents, what do they need to get the kid to what they, you know, what they may need. Um, and, and making choices if you're a commissioner about what kinds of services you are offering families in order to make the most of those first five years of life. Um, do I think that every jurisdiction is doing that? You know, I, of course not. Um, not every jurisdiction is funded to do it. And um, some of this new law, the you know, Families First Prevention Services Act, um, is intended to try to encourage jurisdictions to do that, uh, obviously, among other things. So what are the, you mentioned the services, what are the other tools at the disposal of a family court judge besides removal um, in order to handle families that are having these kind of crises? What, what else can you do as a judge? <laughs> So um, you can enter orders of protection. I think that's you know an important tool so that if there is someone in the home that needs to have their behavior modified as opposed to just an exclusion order, you have to get that person before you and ask them questions and assess their you know, willingness uh, to actually comply with an order and then you have to assess the enforcer of the order to see whether they're willing to actually protect the children or themselves. Um, sometimes they are, and that is that makes a difference, right? If there's an enforceable order protecting the kids and the parent uh, who may be in harm's way, and you are um, able to maintain the family 
the family integrity, you can do that sometimes. You can exclude a parent from the home and keep the kids with a parent more safely. Uh, and you can ensure that, that you know, that you're having the, 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 the matter monitored, for example, by someone from the Child Protective Agency so that there are unannounced visits and you can determine, did he really move out or is he there? Have unannounced visits on Saturdays or at times of day when, um, you know, when they may not be expecting a, a, a worker. You can require a parent to cooperate with a preventive services agency if your jurisdiction has them so that there are supports in the home for the mother and the children uh, in order to address the allegations that were brought by the agency if the mother is willing to do that. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of a case, when you're thinking about a removal, the parent doesn't have to agree to do anything because nothing has been proven against them. Mm -hmm. So you, you basically are looking for the parent to say, I'm worried enough that you're gonna remove my children that I'm willing to comply with your orders. In essence, I'm gonna, con I'm gonna consent to an order um, because I'm worried that things are so at such a high pitch that, that you might remove my kids, which of course I might. You mentioned that uh, a very high proportion of the cases uh, that you saw and uh, cases of kids who are involved in child welfare are from the poorest neighborhoods in New York or the poorest neighborhoods around the country. Um, there is a, a kind of common, uh, in increasingly common narrative out there that the child welfare system um, is basically punishing people for living in poverty. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that, how you as a judge make the distinction between a family that, you know, needs, uh, you know, financial supports of one sort or another uh, versus a family where a child is um, in danger and, uh, and some kind of financial support is not going to necessarily fix that problem. So I think as a judge, uh, the law is what is most important. Uh, and applying, the, and I think this is a real problem in the family court. Um, there are rules of evidence that need to be applied. Um, you are, uh, you know, your job is not to play the lawyer for the government um, or the lawyer for the child. Um, I had been both before I, you know, became a judge. Your job is to hold people to their proof. And in New York, the imminent danger standard is a very high standard. So you can't just remove children because you have a hunch that, that things are, you know, that things aren't good. Um, it is imminent danger, which means it is it is not fleeting. Um, it is real, and that means there has to be a showing that that something is actually um, likely going to happen. Um, or, or, or it has happened. And obviously, if you have a kid that is, you know, you're, you're shown pictures of black eyes, then it's happened. And if you can attribute that to something, that's different. But, um, but I think that the answer to your question about, you know, the, the fear of conflating poverty and neglect is, you really do need to have some proof. Now, if you have a child that has malnutrition, and it's because they haven't been fed, and they're young, then, that, then that's a problem because malnutrition can really be almost, you know, deadly, right? I mean, so, so there, there are, you know, but, but I think that the, the, the important thing for a judge is that they are applying the law. And there are, there's a case in New York, which is nationally known called Nicholson v. Scopetta, which was actually a case that was uh, transferred from the federal court uh, in the Southern District or the Eastern District of New York to our highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals, asking our State Court of Appeals to define imminent danger. Uh, and the reason was that it was so nebulous that uh, judges really didn't have direction and a federal lawsuit was brought on a domestic violence matter where the Administration for Children's Services was challenged that, that they were bringing cases against victims of domestic violence, mothers in, uh, in abuse and neglect cases, and re-victimizing them. 
And the federal courts basically said, look, we don't know what imminent danger is. We don't know whether mothers are being mischarged. We need to know from New York's highest court, what is imminent danger? And our court, our state court of appeals defined it. And their definition was very, you know, that's where we got this whole notion that we need to consider the harm to the mother and the harm to the child of a removal. And imminent danger means imminent. It means now. It means something is going to happen. Uh, they, their language was very strong. And I, I applied that language. So you couldn't just throw things at me, you know, like sour milk in, in a lunch bag and it's imminent danger or the kid shows up at school smelling bad. It's it's a removal. That's not a removal. Yeah. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit now. Uh, we're we're lucky that uh, Judge Richter has worn many hats over the course of his career. And now he's the head of uh, JCCA. And I was wondering if you can describe a little bit of your uh, organization, your role there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about group homes and congregate care too, uh, which are the subject of a lot of national news lately. And I wanted to sort of pick your brain a little bit about that too for for those of you tuning in. Sure. So I should say JCCA, I'm proud uh, to share, is an organization formerly known as the Jewish Child Care Association. We were known uh, by that name since 1940, but we are actually this year celebrating our 200th, 200th anniversary, having started in uh, 1822 by Jews that came to the United States uh, in the uh, 1800s and and wanted, uh, I'm sorry, came to the United States in the 1600s and really wanted to form uh, a charitable organization to give cash grants, charity, to Jews that came in the 1800s to try to help them out because they were struggling so much. And what ended up happening was that um, by the 1840s and 1850s, there were so many immigrant Jewish women having children that they couldn't take care of that we started opening orphanages. And thus, this agency grew into an agency that took care of children who their parents couldn't take care of. And soon in evolved by the turn of the uh, uh, century into an organization that supported children in their homes, became expert in innovative mental health programming for children. And here we are uh, 200 years later, as a full service child and family organization, about a third of our organization is a uh, residential campus in Westchester County that serves about 200 children at a time that has been doing so since 1912. Uh, and so we have a residential campus that um, we have three programs on. Um, one is for very intellectually developmentally delayed children that also have an emotional disturbance, so duly diagnosed kids. Um, one is a residential treatment center for kids that I like to say are like Oliver Twist. They're very smart and um, have been through uh, essentially life on their own in many ways, um, traumatized uh, psychiatric hospitals, but smart as whips and can get over on anyone um, and scarily live with each other. So it's very hard on our staff to manage them, but our goal is to get them stable and sort of take the dysregulation of their early childhood and try to regulate them. Then we have a diagnostic. So um, a place where kids come for 45 days and have a full evaluation and then hopefully go home with a plan um, perhaps go to foster care with a plan. Um, and so it's a very busy place with a um, lot of young people that have varied challenges. Right. So um, group homes, congregate care facilities um, have gotten a not very good reputation in the last few years. Um, and you mentioned the Family First Prevention Services Act. Um, one of the laws recently that has sort of put pressure on states to uh, give less funding to congregate care facilities through various means. Um, can you talk about, you know, why, uh, why institutions like yours or others are not um, kind of considered a good option for kids uh, anymore by policymakers. 
and um, and what what you think the sort of pressure on these states to um, shrink the number and the size of these institutions, uh, who that is affecting and how? So to answer the first part of your question, um, I think that what has informed the policy change is that uh, residential uh, congregate settings were overused uh, for many years. Uh, in New York in 1990, we had almost 50,000 children in care and about 35% of them were in residential care and they really didn't need to be. Today, we have about 8,000 children in care and about 8% are in residential care. And I don't know if they all need to be. Um, we have never really deliberately figured out where a residential placement is appropriate in the child welfare continuum. It has always been um, you know, an easy place to send a kid that you're having trouble placing without a deliberate plan. And so what's ended up happening is we've reduced the use of residential. Um, and, and I wanna add, I think part of the reason we've also reduced it is that young people have become more vocal and have raised very serious concerns about the treatment that they got in residential settings, including mistreatment that's been documented. And, um, and so that's been a real problem for residential settings because we got a bad rap because kids spoke out uh, and said like, I, I was sexually abused, I was physically abused. And so um, our, the, you know, the, the whole community got a bad rap because there are bad actors. And, um, and, and that really contaminated the, 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 the programs that are good. Uh, and, and it's hard to, to, hard to come back from that. Um, so I, I think it's a combination of reasons, including overuse. Uh, and it's very easy to send a kid to a residential as opposed to matching well a child with a foster home and a therapeutic foster home. Um, at the same time, I think that there are young people who for a period of time can benefit if properly placed in a residential setting um, and there are kids who need uh, respite from a community because their ability to uh, cope in their home community becomes deleterious to their ability to sort of manage. Uh, and, and I have met a girl this morning, I'm on the campus, who essentially acknowledged that herself. She comes from a neighborhood in Brooklyn called Brownsville. And um, she was not able to remain, you know, at home to focus on anything because she was running the streets and her mother was just done. She then ended up at what's called the Children's Center in New York City, um, which is an institution where you get placed out of. And she was running the streets from there. And finally, after being there for a couple of months, she came here. And it's very easy to leave here, too. But she was looking for limits and she's in a cottage where the, the, you know, cottage mother, for lack of a better expression, she's called a resident supervisor, is a limit setter. And she has not run. She's stayed put. And, you know, I think that, it, it, you know, if it's the right placement and it's thoughtful, these programs can be helpful. She shouldn't be here for months and months. She probably needs to be here for a few months to get herself together and to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's you know you can't uh, speak in sweeping generalizations, but I think to answer your question, Naomi, that's what happened. It, it was overused. It got a bad rap. Um, we didn't do a good enough job moving children out of our programs. We we you know we have. One kid here that we struggle with who's been here for five years that, you know, after a couple of years, we don't become, we're not no longer useful to a kid. We're housing and, and that's not healthy. So I think that it's a combination of factors. So, um, you know, one last, one last question, Ron, and then I, I think we should turn it over to some questions from folks who are putting questions into the chat. Now, this is a reminder that if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, 
there's a lot of headlines in the last uh, few months about children without placements. So uh, these are kids who are sleeping in child welfare offices, sometimes in hotel or motel rooms. Um, and uh, there's a, been stories about this recently in Philadelphia, in Oregon, in Texas, in New Mexico. Um, where are these kids coming from and why do we suddenly find that there are you know, thousands of kids across the country that we don't have a place to put them? So I, I have a one word answer, which is ideology. And it is really sad to me that, um, that we were so determined to dismantle the residential sort of part of the continuum that we would rather have children in offices sleeping in cots under fluorescent light for however long they need to be because we have made the point that we do not need residential. So instead, we have offices with cots and fluorescent lights and we bring in services. To me, um, that is, you know, uh, so deleterious to, you know, everything we know about good child development, good adolescent development. And um, frankly, I think that uh, it, it was overreach on the part of, I say, ideologues who were like, look, if you build it, they will come. So get rid of it all and we will figure it out. So we are figuring it out on the backs of young people who are struggling in offices. And my answer to it is, if you're going to do that, then at least pull together professional teams that also sleep in the offices and are working 24 seven with the, the, the lawyers who are appearing in the courts and the agencies that are doing the work and put them all at the same place where the kids are sleeping and make them sleep there and plan day in and day out, child by child. But if you're not acting with the sense of urgency that you need to so that children are sleeping in offices, then you had no right to eliminate residential from your child care continuum. Because I do think that residential care when properly um, managed and when there is adequate oversight is better than offices with cots with fluorescent lights. That is not fair to kids. It's not fair to their families. It's not fair to the kids who are doing all sorts of things out on the streets because there isn't sufficient supervision. It's just not right. And to me, that was because ideology took over child welfare. We won't have residential. Well, you know what? You, you don't have residential, you have offices. I don't know what you would call that. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we have a couple questions here in the chat. Uh, the first question, um, some removals to place children into protective care are always likely to be necessary. What can we be doing better to get children back home quickly or at least in a way that is safe and stable? Relatedly, uh, now there's funding under Family First for reunification. Would longer reunification processes be better and not emphasizing limiting the time in foster care? So I guess uh, we'll start with the first one. Uh, what can we be doing to get kids back uh, reunified uh, more safely and, and in a timely manner? So I think <laughs> that the first thing we should be doing is before we do the removal, uh, we should be doing trauma screens on the parent and the child. Uh, and if they determine that there is significant trauma, we should be offering the family uh, very significant uh, evidence-based programming to address the trauma um, in a uh, significant way. So I think that what you see in uh, data that we just uh, worked with Chapin Hall uh, at the University of Chicago to surface in New York for the first time is that children who are removed before they are one year old in New York um, will return to, if they are removed and returned before they are one year old in the state of New York, they will return to care before their 18th birthday 
38% of the time. The likelihood that they will return is determined by a few factors. Among them, the shorter the length of stay, the greater the likelihood they'll return. If they're Black, if they come from a rural area, and if they're moved around a lot during their short length of stay, all contribute to the greater likelihood that they will return to care before they're 18. All this to say that the law requires judges to return children when the imminent danger goes away, which is not hard to eliminate. So you can put a lot in, but then all you've put in doesn't work if there's underlying trauma. And so my hypothesis is that in 38 or so percent of these cases, there is so much underlying trauma that you don't have to address to get your kid back, but you do have to address to keep your kid. Mm. And I would say the answer to your question is we need to figure out how to put in real, substantial, comprehensive services and figure out, even if for a period of time, I know this is terribly controversial to say, but getting parents to agree to have somebody with them in their home for 12, 15 hours a day in the beginning to help them address what is really deep-seated stuff for them and their child. And, and, and I would say that there are dyadic therapies that make sense because if the parent isn't going to unearth what's going on for them, that's really affecting how they're parenting, you're going to just have cycles of what we see. Well, do you think these, um, I mean, one, one criticism that's often made of family courts is the significant delays in the court system. They're overwhelmed. A hundred percent. But, but, you know, that being said, not to, not, not to add to family courts burdens, but, you know, are we checking in with these families frequently enough? You know, are we sort of, you know, saying, okay, try the service, come back to me in three months or six months, only to find out that six months later they haven't really done it or it hasn't been arranged. Well, Naomi, I would say that that isn't the job of the family court. It really isn't. It is the job of a strong uh, social services program based in evidence. Mm -hmm. So it is the, it is the, really the, the social worker who's well-trained, who should be engaging the family and be enough a part of that family's life that you get past the challenge of trust. I mean, no family is gonna trust a judge or a child protective specialist. That is not gonna happen. But a, a family like they trust a pediatrician may trust a real social worker who is implementing a model that has evidence behind it. And, and, and the, the, you know, the families that actually have significant trauma do need real evidence-based social work. I mean, I, you know, you're not going to get to the to the bottom of it unless you're following a model with protocols. And and I do I believe that. Uh, you know, I think that um, that that having a family court judge, you know, I agree with you. See, even if the family court judge saw that saw the family more and was genuinely invested in their success. It's very hard for to ask families to trust a judge in a robe, and and to trust a government lawyer and a and a government caseworker. I, I just think that's asking that that's making it harder to get the family where they need to get. So uh, that sort of leads to the next question here, which is. Um, sort of the question about the relationship between uh, the agency and the court. Um, so uh, we have a question here. Um, data from at least one jurisdiction looked as if the courts were increasingly choosing to close cases or terminate services, even though the Child Welfare Agency did not actually recommend it. Um, so we'd be interested in hearing your observations about the frequency of such situations where a judge is making decisions that are inconsistent with what the agency has recommended. You know, this is so interesting. I, 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 you know, I, I, I would say that, again, we go through sort of, um, you know, there, there, there's that pendulum that swings in child welfare from removal to, um, you know, not removing. And judges, I would say, um, in, in New York City, have recently become sort of anti-government, if I had to characterize where we are right now. They are 
They are um, not, and I can't speak the rest of the country, but they appear to be very um, wary of the position of the Administration for Children's Services. They don't trust us. Um, we have contempt motions against us and the judges are doing hearings on contempt. Like, like holding us in contempt is gonna help children somehow. They, they're, they're punishing of government's position. You know, I think some of that has to do with George Floyd and the fact that, you know, the children in care and their families are black and, you know, government isn't, even though our mayor is. And, you know, I, I don't wanna speak, you know, I don't want, I don't wanna be politically incorrect. I, I, I tend not to be, but the point is that, that, that government is taking a bruising and the courts, I think, feel like, you know, we're sick of it. We, we are, we're, we're done with you. And, um, and so I think on some level, judges are feeling like, you know, the child welfare system hasn't been fair. And now is your time to, to, to sort of take a, a bruising because families have traditionally been mistreated by the child welfare system. Um, and there are examples of how that may be true. And so it is time for us as the court, which sort of holds you accountable to really hold you accountable. I think there's some of that going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think maybe that's what we're seeing, that there's an, there's an anger about the history of the child welfare system that some judges feel like they need to be tough on the government. Whereas when I started, as a lawyer in family court in 1991, you know, whatever the government asked, like you could get a removal literally on sour milk in, uh, in, in, a, in a paper bag for lunch, which was ridiculous, but that's how it was. It's not like that anymore and it shouldn't be. It absolutely shouldn't be. So I think that the pendulum has swung. I, I, I think it'll swing back hopefully just to the middle where it's all fair. But right now, I think we're feeling the bite of, of what happened with George Floyd and how that sent a signal that things are really not right. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you definitely, you, you mentioned the um, uh, courts, courts holding child welfare agencies in contempt. That's just recently happened in Chicago. I think the head of the child welfare agency there had been held in contempt like 12 times or something recently. Um, but I think, you know, for, for outsiders, um, it does make people wonder kind of who has the ultimate authority here? Who is in charge of the child welfare system? And I think, you know, for the folks who are watching this, you know, who are interested in public policy, what, what are the things that we should be thinking about in terms of improving the whole system? I mean, you get this kind of push and pull between yeah. the family court system and the agencies, you know, and, and we're not really talking about, you know, what is, what should the state legislature be doing? What should the governor be doing? Are there changes that should be made in law and policy that would get us out of these, um, you know, kind of back and forth situations, or that would make the public feel more like there is someone uh, being held accountable here for the things that are going wrong in the system? So I'm glad you said that, Naomi, because I absolutely think that there is a role for the legislature. Um, in New York, we have a lot of advocates who are very angry at the child welfare system. And, you know, I engage with them and I think that there's productive work that can come out of their advocacy, namely narrowing the front door of child welfare. I think it is critically important that we stop having everyone in New York being a mandated reporter. Dental hygienists are mandated reporters in New York. Why? That's that, and if it's a dental hygienist, veterinarians, why? Because there's a scenario that someone came up with that like, I brought my dog into the vet with my daughter and she spilled that I'd sexually abused her to the vet. I, I mean, you know, at some point we have to get serious about figuring out why it is that one in two black children in the United States and one in three white children in the United States are investigated by child protection before they're 18. And 22% of those cases are indicated and nothing happens in the majority of them. How much money are we as a country spending on child protective investigations that go nowhere? 
that have nothing behind them. Part of that is stopping <laughs> all of these investigations because, for example, schools call in the most and there's data showing that they're the least reliable. So I think part of what we need to do is work with legislatures to figure out, and there's ways to, you know, there's ways to do this, to figure out how we change our laws so that child protection is used in a much more targeted way to protect children who are really at risk. And they're out there. We know they're out there and we need to be concerned about them. But it's turned into a, a function that is way over broad. And there is a role for the law in, in changing that. So I think that's an area where as public policy experts, we need to be focused on working with legislators who are very afraid to change the law around the state central registry and around abuse and neglect. Our definitions of neglect are, are really overbroad. I mean, you know, the statutes need to be um, reevaluated um, and, and they should be. Um, and, and that's not going to, that ACS or a child protective agency can't change that. Judges can't change that. The, the mandated reporter question is an interesting public policy question because you've seen so much of the um, kind of public pressure on both sides there. I mean, um, a lot of the, some states actually broadened their mandated reporter laws uh, for instance, in the wake of the, um, you know, sexual abuse scandals that involved the Catholic Church or Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania recently broadened its statutes um, because, you know, people were so outraged to find out that there were adults who knew about this kind of maltreatment and didn't say anything. And they want kind of those adults who knew something and kept their mouths shut to be punished. And so you could see, you know, how a public outrage over that sort of thing ends up influencing policymakers, even if those cases tend to be more often the exceptions than the rule. What do you think, you know, how do you think policymakers need to sort of balance those questions? I mean, you know, instances of physical or sexual abuse for children are such hot button issues and they're going to promote, you know, such strong responses from the public. It's an interesting question to see how a, a governor or a state legislator um, would, would be able to talk about those things and balance those interests. So I wanna say that I've been doing this since 1990. And I sat as a judge and referred cases where someone either made a false report as a mandated reporter or didn't report as a mandated reporter to the district attorney's office. They were not prosecuted. I have never in my 32 years of doing this work seen anyone prosecuted for failing to or falsely reporting as a mandated reporter. So I am not exactly sure why mandated reporters are mandated. There are no consequences for doing it or not doing it. And the reason for that is because no one wants to chill anyone from reporting. So this whole idea is, in my view, about ensuring that people are trained about reporting. You don't have to be mandated to require people to be trained. You can mandate training. This whole notion is just smoke and mirrors to make people feel better. I literally, Naomi, have in New York in 32 years, have never seen someone prosecuted for or for not reporting. That's Ever. Fast. Ever. And by the way, it's a misdemeanor. Yeah, it carries a, a fine and potential jail time. Um, I, I mean, it, it, so I would, I would love to, someone to send me reports of who's ever been prosecuted under, under the statute. It's never used, even upon a judicial referral. Well, we have uh, one last time for one last question here. I see a question here. Um, many people say that there is a family court bias against fathers, not necessarily in reference to specific laws, but with the actions of judges and juries. Um, have you seen a pattern of unfair bias against fathers or mothers for that matter in child maltreatment cases? And if so, are there any measures being put in place to fix that? So I think that this is a bias, the father question, 
is a bias in child welfare generally. Um, I don't think that we think enough about fathers. Um, and I think it is sometimes in big sort of urban centers more than in smaller areas um, where there are a lot more fathers involved uh, without having to think about it because they're right in front of you. So I would say that the difference between Westchester County and New York City, uh, which are neighbors, as you know, the Bronx yeah. and Westchester uh, meet uh, geographically, um, you see a lot more fathers in Westchester and our kids on the campus who come from Westchester have two parent households. Most of the kids from the Bronx have one parent households. And so I think that we get lazy in family court and we're not deliberate enough. I used to always require, which the law requires, that there be a notice of pendency served on the father. <laughs> and of course, the agency looked at me like, we don't know who the father is. And I would always say, well, there is, there must be a father. And then they would turn to the mother and say, ma'am, who's the father? Which at that point in the mother's life, she wasn't, you know, that wasn't what she was about to do. So you have to ask as a judge every time if you serve notice of pendency and bug the agency and they will eventually figure out that they do need to find the father because there's resources, there's him himself. Um, but I think the answer is yes, there's a bias, but it's not a deliberate bias. It's a lazy bias. People aren't thinking, you know, like, Sometimes in my snarky days, I would say, who's your father? Oh, you know who your father is. Well, you know, Joe has a father too. You know, and, and, you, and you, you, know, you really have to fight that bias. I think that there are, there's a bias against parents in family court, period. Um, people refer to Mrs. You know, Richter as mom. I would always say, please don't call her mom. She has a name. You know, mommy, that like it, there's a bias against parents. Parents are seen as bad people, as defendants. Um, and it's up to the judge to ensure that that is not, these are, you know, they did, they, they may have done a couple of bad things, according to you, government, in their lives, but they're, according to their children, they're probably the greatest parents in the whole world. So let's, you know, try to change how we approach this and maybe the children will go home sooner. Hmm. All right. Well, those are all the questions we have time for. So I want to thank Judge Richter for joining us today. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in to this uh, installment of the uh, Child Welfare Series. And um, the video of this will be up on the uh, Pepperdine School of Public Policy webpage for the series. Um, and for those of you who are interested, our November 15th uh, session will be with uh, Jed Medifine. He is the head of something called uh, the Christian Alliance for Orphans, which is an umbrella group of foster care and adoptive agencies across the country uh, that uh, help vulnerable children and families. Um, and we're looking forward to having him. So thank you again, everyone for joining us. And thanks again, Judge Richter for especially for taking thank the time. Thank you, thank you.